Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Glad to be able to join you again today for this period of Bible study. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at part of the subject of baptism. You know, most religious groups practice some form of baptism, but it is a lot of division over how it should be performed, who should be baptized, or why. Today, we're going to be looking for just a few moments at the question of how should baptism be administered. You know, many religious groups believe that it really doesn't make any difference how you do it. You can completely immerse a person. You could sprinkle a little water upon him. You could pour a little water upon him. It makes no difference whatsoever. But I submit to you that if you really want to do just what the Bible says, then it requires you to be immersed. And we're going to show three proofs that baptism should be by immersion. The first depends upon the very meaning of the word itself. Now, the word baptism in the English is really a transliteration of the Greek word. And by that, I mean it's simply a Greek word, and you're trans simply transposing or transcribing the Greek letters into the Eng English letters. Therefore, you're really making a new word in the English word. And so it really does not matter what the English word might mean. It depends on what the Greek word from which the word came means. And the original Greek word means an immersion. All dictionaries and Greek lexicons agree that the original word baptizo means to dip or to immerse. Many ancient writers such as Aristotle, Plutarch, and Josephus also used the word uh, to meaning immersion. And there are two other words which might mean pouring or sprinkling, but they are never used in relation to baptism. You see, when we're looking at the proper definition of a word, then we need to realize that the proper definition of that word can be substituted for that word without any problem at all. For example, the word Acts 2.38, the word baptism is used there when Peter, Paul, rather, excuse me, Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Now, if you put the word immersion in there, it makes perfectly good sense. Repent and be immersed for the remission of your sins. That makes just as much sense as the word baptism does. But now let's put the word sprinkling or pouring in there, and you'll find it doesn't make the same. Repent and be poured for the remission of your sins, or repent and be sprinkled for the remission of your sins. In both of those, you immediately see that you got a problem or you got a question. You see, pouring and sprinkling cannot be substituted for the meaning of the word. Only divisible materials can be sprinkled or poured. For example, water and salt or sand, rather. You can pour out a container of water, or you can pour out a container of sand, but you cannot pour a, out a person. You can sprinkle a little salt, and you can sprinkle a little per pepper upon something, but you cannot sprinkle a rock. Now, you might sprinkle something upon a rock. You might pour something upon a rock, but you cannot pour or sprinkle the rock itself. And the same is true of a person. You might sprinkle or pour something upon a person, but you cannot sprinkle or pour the person himself. So only divisible materials can be sprinkled or poured, and obviously you cannot divide a person. God's Word also supports immersion. For example, in John 3 and verse 23, it says concerning Jesus' baptism, or rather John's baptism, it said, Now John also was baptizing in Enon near Salim, because there was much water there. 
Notice it said that John was baptizing in a certain area because there was a lot of water there. Now, if John was baptizing an area because there was a lot of water, then that means he must be immersing people because it would not require much water at all for just sprinkling or pouring. Furthermore, we see that the New Testament instances of baptism has the people going into the water. For instance, when Jesus was baptized in Matthew 3 and verse 16, it said when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Now, obviously, you do not have to come up out of the water when you're only sprinkling or pouring a little person, a little water upon a person. The same is true in Acts chapter 8 and verses 36 through 38. In Acts chapter 8, we find the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember the story how the Ethiopian had been to Jerusalem to worship and he was traveling back home. And so the Holy Spirit told Philip to join himself with the chariot. And so Philip got in the chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch and began to teach him And then as they were traveling along, then, of course, the eunuch wanted to be baptized. He said in verse 36, he says, See, here is water. What hinders me to being baptized? And, of course, Peter says, If you believe, you can. And the Ethiopian eunuch made the good confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, notice in verse 38. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And then in beginning of verse 39, it said, Now when they came up out of the water. Thus we see here that the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip both went down into the water, and they came up out of the water. Now, as we said before, you do not have to go into the water and come up out of the water just to get a little bit of water to sprinkle or pour upon a person. That would be rather silly to go down into the water if you just need just a very little bit of water. Furthermore, the very idea that the eunuch had to wait until he saw some water on the side of the road implies that it was an immersion. For example, the Ethiopian had been traveling a long distance, traveling to Jerusalem and back. Now, you know, most likely he would have some water in a container with him because there was no water fountains. There was no uh, places to get water along the way. It was a deserted area, that is, a place with no people there. And so I find it very unlikely that he would have absolutely no water with him if he was going to be traveling for several hours all by himself in a deserted area. Well, everybody would carry some water with him. Everybody knows that if you're going to a place that you carry water with him. And so therefore the eunuch most likely had a little water in a container with him so if he all he needed was just a little bit of water to sprinkle or pour upon him, then why did he have to wait until there was a pool of water by the side of the road? You see, every picture, every word picture of baptism in the New Testament shows it to be an immersion. For example, in Romans 6 and verse 4, Paul said, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Here in this verse, Paul said that baptism is a burial, that we are buried with Christ in baptism. And through baptism, we walk or begin to walk a new life. The same word picture is found in Colossians 2 and verse 12, where Paul said, Buried with him in baptism, in which you're also risen with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So in both of these verses, we find that Paul said that baptism is a burial. You are buried with Christ. Now we know what a burial is. When a person dies, we bury them sometimes, and we know that if you're going to bury a person, that you have to completely cover him with the dirt. 
that you cannot bury a person by just sprinkling a few grains of sand upon him or just putting a few clods of dirt upon a person. The only way you bury a person is to completely immerse him or completely cover him with the dirt. And so baptism is a burial in water. That means you're completely covered with the water. You are immersed. And then the third argument to show that baptism in the Bible is an immersion is the evidence from history. Chrysostom, who died in about 400 A.D., wrote a commentary on 1 Corinthians, and in that commentary he made this statement, For to be immersed and to sink down and then to emerge is a symbol of the descent into Hades and of the ascent from thence. Therefore Paul calls the immersion the tomb, saying, We were buried therefore with him by the immersion into death. So he said that Paul called baptism an immersion, and he said that we must be doing the same thing. Well, there's many other religious leaders who says the same thing. Martin Luther, who began the Lutheran church, who I believe today practices largely sprinkling or pouring, he says they ought to be wholly immersed and immediately to be drawn out, for the etymology of the word seems to require it. So Martin Luther himself recognizes that the word requires immersion. John Calvin, a very early Christian leader, said they ought to be holy, or excuse me, the word baptize itself signifies immerse. And it is certain that the rite of immersing was observed by the primitive church. So again, John Calvin said baptism means an immersion. And he further goes on to say, it is absolutely certain that the early church practiced immersion. Well, the Catholic church believes the same thing. The Catholic church, who today largely practices sprinkling, they also would agree that the early church practiced immersion. As a matter of fact, they would say for 1,300 years, baptism was an immersion of the person under water. It was only changed in the Council of Ravenna in 1311 where it, be, where it finally legalized sprinkling. For 1,300 years, except under rare conditions, was sprinkling ever used as an option for baptism. Now, why is the practice of sprinkling or pouring become so prevalent? If the Bible requires immersion, then why do so many religious groups today practice something else? Well, there might be several reasons. One reason might be by convenience. It is certainly much more convenient to have just a little bit of water than a lot of water to immerse someone. Uh, you might not have a place uh, to hold that much water. It might be hard to find that much water, especially in cold countries where it gets very cold, the water gets very cold. Then to immerse a person in that cold climate might be very difficult sometimes. So it is certainly more convenient, but we cannot use our own wisdom to change God's will just for convenience. We, I think we also have a loss of respect for the authority of God's Word. You see, many people have fallen into the fallacy of assuming that apostolic commands and examples are not always binding. In other words, we can use our own wisdom to make changes to further fit into our culture or our desires or whatever. But human wisdom cannot change God's commands. Another reason I think it's shame because some people look upon baptism as simply a church ritual or a church ordinance. Now, if it is merely a church ritual, then, of course, the church could change it any way they wanted to. But it is not a church ritual. It is a God's command. And since God made the command, then we cannot change it just to fit our own wisdom. Remember, Philip Schaff wrote a, The History of the Christian Church. And in that book, he made this statement. Unquestionably, immersion expressed the idea of baptism more completely than sprinkling. But it is a pedantic Jewish literalism to limit the operation of the Holy Spirit by the quality or quantity of the water. 
water is absolutely necessary to baptism as an appropriate symbol of the purifying and regenerating energy of the Holy Ghost. But whether it be in large quantity or small, cold or warm, fresh or salt, from river, cistern, or spring, is relatively immaterial. Well, I agree with him that where you get the water makes no difference. But the reason it makes no difference is because the Bible says nothing about that. The Bible says nothing at all about where you get the water to baptize a person. But as we've already seen, the Bible does say something about the quantity of the water. It said that it must be by immersion. Now, when we say that it must be immersion, then we're not limiting the power of God. You see, the question is not, can God say by a little water or a lot of water? God could say by no water of all if he chose, chose, but he didn't. God can certainly chase, save us by a little water if he so chooses. But the question is not whether he can. The question is, what did he say? And we've already seen, I think, that the Bible subscribes to immersion. The Bible supports the idea and requires the idea that baptism is an immersion. So therefore, when we say then that you must be immersed in order to be properly baptized, we're not limiting the power of God. We're simply doing what God says. It is a matter of obedience or disobedience to God. Are you going to do what God says? Or are you going to try to substitute your own human wisdom? You see, that's really the question. And I think you would agree that we must not substitute our human wisdom for the command of God. We must simply be content with doing what God says. God is the authority. We are his servants. And if we're going to be good servants of the Almighty God, then we will be content to do what he says. We will not substitute our own wisdom or desire. So therefore, baptism then should be by immersion because that's what God says. Are you going to obey God's command? I hope that you have been baptized by immersion, but if you haven't, then again, I would encourage you to study more and maybe call the number on the screen, and some will be more than happy to talk with you further about this very important subject. Thank you. It is God's will that you must be saved. First, listen to the Bible truth. And you must believe the truth. Then you must repent from your sinful life. Then you must confess by words that the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Every day our Lord added those who were being saved into his church. Be blessed by studying the word of God. To receive the Voice of Truth International Magazine and to study the Bible systematically through our English Bible Correspondent Course. Kindly write to us. Our address, Gracious Word, P.O. Box 15, Arsradi Madurai, 625016, Tamil Nadu. For more details, dial 9244204420, 9244214421. God bless you. The Church of Christ salutes you.